Okay, it's a great honor to introduce uh, Professor Gloria Caruthi here. Welcome, Mr. Davis. You don't really realize how honored we are that she actually stepped outside New York. <laughs> she started her career at uh, as a graduate student in yeast molecular genetics, working with Professor Sagalow, working on um, mitochondrial coding capacity of the yeast uh, at um, Rockefeller University. Right? Columbia. Sorry, Columbia. Columbia. <laughs> and then she went to Rockefeller where she was working on the very first, uh, as Nan Maitua was starting up his lab in plant molecular biology. She's been one of the pioneers of Arabidopsis molecular genetics over the years. And uh, has sort of really gone along with uh, first, you know, one gene at a time, then one pathway at a time. She had a long term interest in nitrogen assimilation and nitrogen efficiency. And uh, has really become a pioneer in trying to take a systems biology approach to uh, complex phenomena such as nitrogen assimilation and use. Uh, in so doing, she's assimilated a lot of computational approaches along with the uh, current. She moved from uh, postdoc uh, into the faculty at Rockefeller University. And then in 91, she joined all the way across town at NYU. Uh, and there she heads up the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology. She's there, the Carol and Milton Petrie Professor. Uh, she's numerous awards. She's a member of uh, the, the fellow of the American Advancements of uh, AAAS, uh, the Groffitz Fellow of Biochemistry, Physiology, and Microbiology of Plants in Montpellier, France, a brief social on outside <laughs> New York. <Next> week. Um, <coughs> she's also served on many editorial boards and been very helpful in terms of one of the leaders in the area of plant molecular biology and giving it visibility. Uh, at the national level. She's also on the scientific advisory board, the Donald uh, Davenport Plant Science Centre, and been one of the uh, motivators of the International Rabidopsis Informatics Consortium. So, uh, welcome to Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, hmm, I'm wired. All right, so thanks for coming. It's quite a showing in the audience. And um, I guess I want to uh, thank Rich for inviting me. And um, today what I'd like to, uh, if you take home two messages today, um, one is that I think the uh, systems biology approach is a way to integrate the massive amount of genomic data that we have into uh, models that enable us to develop testable hypotheses from all this massive data. And then the second point of systems biology modeling is, oh, so wait, back to the hypothesis. So in a, in a sense, systems biology is the opposite of the old biology where you had a hypothesis, you tested it, and then you went forward. Here, you just have a lot of data uh, you develop a hypothesis from that data by integrating it, and then you test it. So that's point one. And then point two is that the ultimate goal of systems biology is not just to model the data you know, but it's to generate a model that enables you to predict how the system will react under an untested condition. So predictive network modeling is the real uh, goal of systems biology. Um, and you could imagine yourself uh, at a computer terminal and you want to produce more starch in, the, in potatoes but not at the expense of some other lipids or something. And you could imagine yourself saying, okay, if I tweak these genes, run the model and show me how, what the outcome will be. That's very futuristic. But, you know, things happen fast, so maybe within our lifetime. All right, let's see if I can get this right. So um, we, I work at New York University's Center for Genomics and Systems Biology, and uh, this is our um, pretty nice new genome center. Not anything on scales uh, of California, but it has 14 uh, faculty that uh, do genomics and systems biology, and uh, that's the view from our <laughs> conference room on the top floor in our core facility, which is one of the reasons I like working in New York. I can work all the time and still get the benefit of seeing the view. 
All right, so um, this slide, I'm, I'm going to actually, as I go along, acknowledge the people that did the work while I'm telling you about the work, because I've had quite a few creative postdocs that I'm going to tell you about their work. Uh, this is our Genome Center logo. It's our Washington Square Arch, which is like this Arc de Triomphe in Greenwich Village, but in a network view. This are sources of funding for now. Uh, this is uh, NYU. Uh, my, my lab does both uh, genomics and informatics, and pretty much everybody in my lab does some informatics. So you can't leave my lab until you learn R. And I think for the younger folks in the audience, that's the future. Um, analyzing your data is the way that you really get uh, hypotheses, because computer scientists really don't know the biology by and large. And so I think that the people who do both are the most creative. Uh, we do uh, heavily uh, collaborate with computer scientists at NYU Courant Institute of Math and Computer Science, especially Dennis Shasha, uh, who up until recently wrote the puzzle column for Scientific American, and Jan LeCun, who's pretty well known in the field of machine learning because he wrote that uh, program that recognizes your signature when you sign a, a check at the bank. Um, so, um, and then uh, alumni collaborators that I'm going to tell you about, collaborators within our institution, and I hope I can speak fast enough to get to a project uh, on evolutionary genomics at the very end. All right. So I think I told you already that um, genomics and systems biology is taking a lot of data. Uh, that doesn't mean that you don't have to have a biological question. You have to have a question that you're interested in, an area. Our case, the area is nitrogen use efficiency. And so we generate data either by using treatments, mutants, genomic analysis. It could be transcriptomics, proteomics, whatever. And then uh, analyze the data in the context of networks that enable us to integrate the data into models that enable us to derive hypotheses that we could test. And then we've also uh, uh, gone into the field of making predictive network models based on time series data that I'm going to tell you about. So very briefly, I just want to introduce you to uh, networks and how they help us to understand biological systems um, and put the pieces together. And then I'm going to give you three examples from our work where the systems approach enabled us to uncover new biology. Uh, one uh, has to do with the network integration of data that enabled us to understand nutrient control of the circadian clock. Uh, network dynamics, uh, where we've made predictive network models based on time series data, and uh, how we've identified how networks adapt to the environment in terms of root foraging. And at the very end, I'm going to tell you, because we developed these approaches to enable biologists to touch their own data and analyze their own data. We wanted to make them available to the community through a software platform called Virtual Plant. All right, so networks and biological systems. Oh, I went the wrong way. All right, so networks, um, you know, it's not very difficult to understand. It sounds difficult, but it's not. Uh, networks are made up of nodes and edges that connect them. And those edges uh, can be, and nodes, we can have different kinds of networks. For example, the social network where you're connected to your neighbor by some kind of an interaction, and if you're very popular, you have a lot of edges. Um, cities, can, you can make a network view of cities in the US, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. But the reason that we're here is because we're interested in gene networks and how, for example, you could link a transcription factor to its target by an edge. But I think um, the idea of linking genes or any other kinds of nodes in a network is that you're looking for what are called emergent network properties. How does the, how does the network operate as a system? And how can that tell you something about the whole that you couldn't tell by knowing any of its parts in isolation? And I think a good example of this uh, comes from looking at um, highway and other connections that connect cities to look at properties of networks. So in this view of the US, um, there the nodes are cities and the highways are the blue edges that connect them. And you could see that every city pretty much has the same number of highway connections. 
and this is called a random network. By contrast, um, if you were to connect the cities by airline routes, you could see that there are a few cities in red that have many connections. So there's very few nodes that have many connections, and most nodes have few connections. And the nodes with many connections are called hubs, and you see that in the airline uh, pocket in front of you. Um, New York and Chicago are hubs. And there's two things about these, um, these networks that are called scale-free. One is that these hubs enable you to get, for example, from New York to somewhere west of here in two hops, uh, whereas if you had to go through this route, you'd have to go through a lot of nodes to get there. So you've heard the word small-scale networks, small-world networks. I'm connected to Obama by two hops because my high school student won the Intel Prize last year. So there. Um, the other thing about these networks is that they give the system robustness. So it turns out that most biological networks are scale-free, and the reason is they make, uh, they're robust to, um, to um, failure. So for example, if any node in this network were to um, fail, it would disrupt the system. By contrast, in the scale-free networks, if I randomly uh, attacked a, a hub, uh, excuse me, a node, uh, the system would still operate. And we know that um, systems have to operate for organisms to be robust, so this uh, is a good thing for biology. However, if you uh, attack one of the hubs, you disrupt the system. So uh, our approach has been to build gene regulatory networks, which largely look like this, um, to uh, attack the hubs, either by mutation or overexpression, and see how it affects the system. So that's the, that's the idea. And I'm going to give you three examples where we've used that approach. All right, so what biological system do we study? So we're interested in how plants uh, use nitrogen, so nitrogen use efficiency. It's important because uh, nitrogen fertilizer is costly, it consumes energy, and it contaminates the environment. And basically, there are three aspects that we've been uh, looking at. Uh, one is how do plants forage for nitrogen in the soil? How do they assimilate it into organic form? And then how do they store it? And so um, we, uh, in using a network approach, we've been able to identify the mechanisms that regulate these three uh, areas that affect nitrogen use efficiency and to identify candidate genes that regulate these processes by developing hypotheses. And the, the, the large picture that we've understood from these studies is that um, nitrate actually is a signal, it's not just a metabolite, and as a signal, it uh, activates both root foraging and nitrogen assimilation. And then it, as nitrogen is assimilated into organic form, that too is a signal, and it basically represses further assimilation, kind of saying, don't waste your ATPs making more glutamine, I have enough, and represses uh, root foraging for nitrogen, again, most likely an energy conservation system, and induces uh, the synthesis of asparagine, uh, which is used for long-term nitrogen storage because it's in inert. So um, I'll tell you about how we've identified components of this system. I keep forgetting. All right, so that was the introduction to the system. Now I'll go into the three case studies. And I'm gonna do the first one relatively quickly because um, you know, actually all of these examples are published, but that was the, I would say the first example where we really derived a novel hypothesis from data integration via networks. So uh, we were interested in how um, plants assimilate inorganic nitrogen into organic form. And from our molecular studies, we knew that glutamine synthetase was an important enzyme for making glutamine and asparagine synthetase was important for converting glutamine to asparagine for storage. And uh, we wanted, but we didn't know anything about the regulatory components that affected the regulation of nitrogen assimilation. 
Either it's induction by the presence of nitrate or repression by glutamine. So to get at those uh, components, we um, did the following experiment. We treated plants with nitrate, either in the presence or absence of an uh, inhibitor of glutamine synthetase. <coughs> and then, uh, so it was nitrate plus or minus MSX. And then we uh, also could add back exogenous, exogenous glutamine. So we could actually identify genes that are responsive to nitrate, to glutamine, or to both. And we found that there are roughly 800 genes that responded to either inorganic or organic nitrogen or both. So uh, what we wanted to do next was we have a list of 824 genes. Now here, where as I get to my example, is I have a list of genes. I have no hypotheses. So in order to figure out, is there a biological connection between these 834 genes, we developed the Arabidopsis multi-network. By we, I mean this was developed by a very talented uh, former postdoc, Rodrigo Gutierrez, who's uh, now a professor in Chile and an international Howard Hughes investigator. Um, in this example, we show gene one connected to gene two by an edge. And it's called a multi-network because that edge represents multiple kinds of connections between those two genes. And the multi-network incorporates connections between enzymes in a biochemical pathway that we get either from KEG or RSI. Uh, it includes transcription factor target interactions that are either validated in a database called AGRIS or predicted, and our predictions are based on two rules. One is the transcription factor and its target gene have to be correlated above, in this case, uh, 0.7. Uh, and the binding site for that transcription factor has to be overrepresented rep relative to its presence in the entire genome. Protein-protein interactions are based on the interactome data from Ecker and Vidal, as well as others. Uh, microRNA RNA interactions from Mirbase and ASRP. And then finally, a text mining tool called GeneWays um, reads uh, papers of uh, experimental validation. And if two genes are in a sentence and the word bind, interact, or activate is in that sentence, then our program draws an edge between those two genes. And if you click on that edge, it takes you to the sentence in the paper. So you, can you don't have to read anymore, which <laughs> people don't do anyway. <laughs> Um, so taking that um, approach, we now have a multi-network uh, made up of all of these types of interactions. I should note, and I didn't note before, that in our DNA protein interaction database is the data from Siobhan Brady's lab, which has actually validated uh, transcription factor DNA interactions as well. So we have this multi-network, and it, people say, OK, this is a hairball. And it really annoys me when people say that, <laughs> because I would say it's a ball of knowledge. Think of it like the Encyclopedia Britannica in a ball. Um, and so we now take all the possible interactions between genes, and we interrogate it with data from our 824 nitrogen-responsive genes. And when we interrogate this, so this means they have to be nitrogen regulated. There's correlation data from that. And they have to have at least one of those other interactions. And then we find a subnetwork of a, six, roughly half of the genes are connected by some other form of connection in addition to their nitrogen regulation. That was kind of surprising. So now, um, that's still a lot of genes. So how do we derive hypotheses from that many genes? So now we look at the structure of the network, and we uh, created a hubbiness table. And we identified uh, one of the hubbiest nodes in the network was CCA1. And CCA1 is a MIB transcription factor that's the master regulator of the circadian clock. And so uh, we uh, explored the network neighborhood around that hub. And we uncovered connections to genes in the nitrogen assimilation pathway. And I'm just going to show you one of the hypotheses that we derived and validated from those connections. Um, the network predicts that CCA1 activates GLIN1, 
and that it represses ASN1 indirectly by repressing an activator of ASN1. So that was network connections that we got from that larger network. Um, this model predicts that plants activate glutamine synthesis when nitrates around and repress it when you have enough glutamine. So that could be a way to say, stop, I have enough. And also by repressing glutamine repression of CCA1, it's repressing a repressor of BZIP that activates BZIP1 to activate ASN1 and make its pharyngene. So this was the, uh, a model for how plants regulate the uh, control of uh, making, um, I keep getting these wrong, of making glutamine and converting it into asparagine, sorry. Okay, so to test this model and validate the predictions, we overexpressed CCA1 using 35S, and this led to increased expression of GLIN1 and decreased expression of ASN1 which was predicted by the model. The other thing that this model um, predicted was that um, CCA1, I told you, is the central MIB factor controlling the clock. And so if glutamine represses the expression of CCA1, we would expect that nitrogen sources would possibly regulate the circadian clock. And to test this hypothesis, we collaborated with Rob McClung uh, at Dartmouth and uh, where we used a CCA1 promoter to derive luciferase expression. And this gene is expressed in a circadian fashion over two days. The dark bars are the presumptive night. These are grown in continuous light. And what we showed was that when we treated plants with pulses of glutamine, it phase delayed the clock by two hours, whereas nitrate pulses phase advanced the clock two hours, thus confirming the hypothesis that organic nitrogen regulates the clock. It was known that um, the clock regulated nitrogen assimilation, but the new biology was that the products of nitrogen assimilation now fed back to regulate the clock. So this is probably my best example of how a hypothesis derived from a lot of data led to a real insight into biology, and this kind of opened up the field of nutrient regulation of the clock in plants. All right, so the next story, so those, um, those networks were very beautiful, and in fact, a lot of the edges in that original network have uh, turned out to be confirmed to operate in other species, like maize, for example, so that discoveries that we've made in Arabidopsis can have translation to crops, um, and we're pretty excited about that. However, the, the problem with those networks is they're static, and we know that life is not static. And so we wanted to see if we could create networks that were dynamic for two reasons. One is because that would tell us what was happening in real time. And second, because if you remember, going back to that uh, model of the US, if I now look at a dy dynamic view of flights coming into the states from Europe, I can start to see hubs as they're forming Whereas at the, at the steady state, they would be A, very hard to I identify, and secondly, time series data is especially important for making predictive networks because it's causal. Things that happen at time t, t will affect things that happen at time t plus one, and you could make predictions based on this data. So a very uh, talented postdoc uh, came to my lab from Montpellier, France, Gabrielle Crook, who is a Marie Curie fellow in my lab. And Gabrielle um, decided to take on the project of creating a time series data from which we could generate predictive network models. And the way he did this was he uh, treated plants with nitrate and then collected RNA every three minutes for the first time points and then later for the later time points. And when he did qPCR on genes that we knew were nitrogen responsive on this data, he found that uh, the genes like nitrate transporter are induced by nitrate treatment by about 20 minutes compared to KCL controls, the same thing for NEO1. And in fact, the 15 to 20 time point when these, sen these target genes are activated was the earliest time point that anybody had looked at nitrogen responsive genes prior to the study. So Gab's interest was to 
uh, do transcriptome analysis on these early time points to identify genes that were activated early in the response and to identify transcription factors which might be responsible for the activation of these genes at the later time points. So um, Gab generated this data set, which was quite beautiful, and uh, this just shows you the heat map of genes that are as they're uh, being induced or repressed in response to the treatments. And uh, this analysis identified 200 genes that had not been previously identified to be nitrogen responsive. And in particular, the nitrogen responsive genes at the three and six minute time points were essentially 100% new knowledge. So um, now to identify uh, how these genes might work uh, in, a, in, in time, over time, uh, he then uh, mod modeled the expression of a gene based on its, the influence of nitrate, time, and a combination of nitrate and time. And using this linear model, he was able to identify about 450 genes who res which responded to nitrate as a function of time. And here's an example of one of them. This is an early response transcription factor that's regulated by nitrogen at three and six minutes, but not at nine and 20. So it's activated early and then its activation goes down. And so we finally now had the time series data to give to the computer scientists, machine learners, to do their magic on and come up with a predictive model. So what's their magic? Okay, so their magic, this is Gloria and Gab's version of what their magic does. And for the computer scientists in the audience, I could maybe tell you more at the break. Uh, so here's our time series data, transcriptome heat map at time t, t plus one, t plus two, t plus three. And they use something called state space modeling. And what that model does is it takes transcription factor expression values at time t, and it can take up to 10 transcription factors, and it tries to model a function where they can act either in a positive or a negative way to regulate a target gene expression at time t plus one. So you're modeling the expression of a gene at time t plus one based on a combination of expression values for a transcription factor at time t. So you do that, you learn this f function, and then you iterate and you keep learning it and refining it over time until you get an f function model that does not change. Okay, so you have this model. Uh, how do you know it's correct and how do you know it's predictive? So uh, what these computer guys do is they do something called, a, they leave out data, so you have a set of data and if I built my model on my 20 minute data and I predicted, let's say 25 minutes, I would have no way to validate whether my predictions were correct. So instead, we've now built, we use something called a leave out last test, where we build the networks based on the data up until 15 minutes. I put the 20 minute data in my back pocket. And then I say, okay, now that you've learned the F function, predict for me uh, the response of a gene in that network at time t at 20 minute time point. And remember, I have the data in my back pocket to validate it. And when we did that, we were 74% correct in predicting whether a gene would go up or down in the network at 20 minutes. And I guess um, I said to Dennis, well, you know, that's okay. I'm not sure that that's, did we really learn? I said, you know, if I knew that a gene went up between nine and 15 minutes, I'm gonna say it goes up at 20 minutes. And if I did that, that's called a naive trend forecast test. Turns out they have a name for it. And <laughs> if I did that, I'm right only, it's a coin toss. So in fact, we did learn. What was startling about this is we had really very little data points, you know, it's that we had, I think, two replicates, three replicates each, so that's a, really small amount of data for machine learning. But this algorithm, the state space modeling, has a way to deal with noise reduction, and I think uh, that was key to its work working. And so now we have a, a state space model where we have our version of the airline routes. So we can identify a, t a transcription factor hub of this network 
which itself uh, regulates a, about 39 transcription factors that regulate um, whoops, the um, 10 genes in the nitrogen assimilation pathway as a function of time. And so uh, in order to uh, validate these, um, it's easy to imagine that you would start with the hub, but we also want to validate 39 transcription factors. And so um, we uh, developed a, and I think the top of my slides, whatever, has cut off a bit. We developed a high throughput um, method to validate transcription factor targets genome-wide and we call it target for transient assay reporting genome-wide effects of transcription factors, and we, it was just published in Molecular Plant, and the idea is simple. Uh, you transiently express a 35S fusion to a, a 35S driven transcription factor glucocorticoid receptor fusion protein. What that does is it leads to a buildup of your transcription factor GR fusion in the cytoplasm because uh, HSP90 binds to the glucocorticoid receptor domain and it holds it in the cytoplasm. So you've overexpressed it, but it's hanging out in the cytoplasm until you treat it with dexamethasone, which disrupts the HSP90. And with de dexamethasone induction, your transcription factor now goes into the nucleus, binds to its targets, activates transcription. And if you do this in the presence of cyclohexamide, you can identify the primary targets. And so um, this is a rapid system for any transcription factor that you'd like. By the, if you clone it into Gateway, uh, you could have your results within two weeks' time. So after we do the dexamethasone treatment, we do microarray or RNA-seq. And in this paper, we've given the example of ABI3. We've identified its genome-wide targets and by comparing the genome-wide targets in this system compared to whole plants, uh, we had a greater than, um, I think it was a 50 to 60 percent overlap, considering they were done in different labs, protoplasts versus whole plants. We think that's pretty good, and it's a first uh, pass. All right. So uh, the network dynamics has given us a lot of hypotheses to test, and we're trying to develop high-throughput methods to test them. Okay, and the final example, I want to tell you about how we've applied the um, network uh, approach to understand how plants forage for nitrogen and what controls that. So this uh, project was done by a very talented uh, postdoc, Sandrine Ruffel, also from Montpellier, which happens to be my favorite place these days. And it was done in collaboration with Ken Birnbaum. And uh, this project re uh, attacked how to, the question of how do plants forage for nitrogen? What are the mechanisms underlying nitrogen foraging in roots? And to do this, uh, Sandrine brought with her from France a very elegant system that we adapted to Arabidopsis, which is called the split root system. And in this uh, s split root system, the roots of a single plant are split between two environments a nitrogen-rich environment and a nitrogen-poor environment. And you can see that the roots on the side of the nitrogen-rich environment, the lateral roots, are growing uh, more abundantly than they are on the KCL side. Uh, the KNO3 side is foraging for this available nitrogen. Um, and so we use this system uh, to do our transcriptomic experiments to try to identify what are the genes that are controlling this active nitrogen foraging by the roots in response to nitrogen deprivation on their other side? So they're talking to each other. One side saying, I got a lot of nitrogen here, assimilated, and that really is a soil environment. The soil is not a homogeneous environment. The soil environment has patches of nitrogen richness and that plants need to take advantage of. So the setup is like this. We have the one uh, set, and I should, I will mention that when I was in Montpellier on my sabbatic, I split roots um, like this for uh, 50 ecotypes of Arabidopsis. So that would be 6,000 Arabidopsis seeds and 78 liters of media that I poured. <laughs> More to come on that. 
Um, but this is just on the Columbia ecotype, which was our first experiment. So um, here's the split root plant. Again, one side is exposed to uh, nitrogen rich media, the other to nitrogen poor. And one nice thing about this setup is if I compare to, let's say, control where KCL is on both sides, nitrogen poor, to nitrogen rich, you know, the plant is undergoing a starvation response as well. Whereas in the split root setup, they're not nitrogen deprived as a plant, they're just nitrogen deprived on one part of the plant. And so we're following the signal that one part of the plant tells the other, you know, I'm, I'm starving, you know, help me. So uh, the way it works is this. If you compare um, the s these, these roots are in the same local nitrogen replete environment. So this root half and these roots are in the same local environment. The only thing different about this one is that its other root half is nitrogen starved. So if we look at lateral root elongation in these two environments, anything that's different in this half compared to this half, excuse me, this half compared to these is due to a signal coming from the other side. So in fact, um, this uh, increased elongation of lateral roots on this uh, split root compared to these is due to a signal of nitrogen demand coming from the other side and now this lateral elongation is measured in a function of days, but we were interested in the genes that affect this response. So we were interested in what happens in hours after transfer to this media. And we found a set of genes that specifically are regulated in response in this half that are different from the response in, in these halves. So they're responding to a systemic nitrogen demand signal. By contrast, on the other side of the equation, these two uh, local environments are nitrogen deplete, and this plant is exposed to a nitrogen replete environment. Again, anything that's different between these two roots, so for example, the suppression of lateral roots on this side is due to a signal that's coming from the nitrogen supply side that says, don't waste your energy making roots on your side, I got you covered. Um, and so, and the same thing happens for gene expression. There are a set of genes that are activated in response to this nitrogen supply signal. I should say that the nitrogen supply signal is uh, something that we only uncovered because we bothered to do this control. In previous split root experiments done in Metacago, they only compared these two. So um, taken together, uh, we found these genes that are responsive to systemic nitrogen signaling, either answering to nitrogen supply on the other half or demand on the other half. And there's about 123 genes that are activated in roots in this response. And so we use them to do this list of genes to do two things. One is we took this list of genes and we picked a few that we used as sentinel genes to report to us on uh, nitrogen signaling in mutants that we used to dissect the response. So for example, um, we uh, were able to, so we have the systemic nitrogen demand signal and a systemic nitrogen supply signal, and we were able to show using a nitrate reductase double mutant that nitrate is the signal that is sent because this signaling system happens even if plants can't reduce nitrate to, uh, for example, uh, nitrite. So nitrate is the signal. We also uh, showed that if we chopped off the shoots, that again, the signaling was disrupted, uh, meaning that the shoot was important for one root to communicate to the other root that it needed nitrogen. Um, this nitrogen demand signal it turns out uh, we used cytokine and synthesis mutants to show that it's cytokine independent. So this basically um, uncovered a root shoot root signal that is, uh, involves an interplay between nitrate and cytokinin. Um, we also remember uh, this, is dis this systemic signaling is distinct from local signaling 
and it's also distinct from starvation signaling. So we have systemic signaling, either supply or demand, we have local signaling, and we have starvation signaling. So we have a lot of signaling going on. But another way to start to get at what are the genes or regulatory components involved in this is by querying our multi-network with our set of 123 genes that respond to systemic nitrogen signals. And we're able to identify a, um, a network a module of two transcription factors that in fact control genes involved in nitrogen assimilation in response to these um, signals. It also intersects carbon metabolism and energy production. So the plant is really integrating a lot of different signals and regulating a lot of different metabolic processes. And this is what I would call essentially the real systems approach. You're integrating signals within the plant as a system, not just through networks. Um, uh, as a coda, in addition to this uh, sensing system for external nitrogen, in a previous, uh, a previous postdoc from the lab uncovered uh, uh, mechanisms by which plants sense whether they have enough organic nitrogen to shut down further foraging. That postdoc was an EMBO fellow, uh, Miriam Gifford, who was in my lab, and she's now a professor at University of Warwick in, in the UK. And this project was done with Ken Birnbaum. And very briefly, what Miriam did was she took cell-marked lines, treated them with nitrogen, and she was able to uncover uh, cell-specific nitrogen responses. And so you can, uh, by querying the multi-network with the cell-specific data, you can get cell-specific networks. And you will uncover things that you won't uncover if you use whole tissues. So really, data in is the important limiting factor to hypotheses out. Um, and so in these uh, four stories that I told you, um, we've been able to uncover mechanisms of how plants regulate nitrogen assimilation in response to nitrogen signaling. We've been able to make predictive regulatory networks in roots to identify mechanisms involved in the nitrogen induction of root foraging and the glutamine repression. So those are, I'd like to give these examples because I really don't like it when people say that systems biology is just a bunch of hairball networks. Uh, these were real biological hypotheses that we had no idea of until we made the networks and did the analysis. All right, so um, finally, um, because we developed a lot of tools with the idea of enabling biologists to touch and analyze their own data and not to be dependent on computer scientists only, um, we embodied those uh, those tools into a software platform called the Virtual Plant, which was developed by Rodrigo Gutierrez, who I also already told you about, Dennis Shasha, and Manpreet Katari, who's actually at the Mays meeting unveiling Mays Virtual Plant, or was at the Mays meeting this week, last week. And um, basically the concept for Virtual Plant software uh, was inspired by, an, uh, think of it like an e-commerce site. In an e-commerce site, you have customers, they have some product inventory, they can browse, they can query, they buy things, put them in a shopping cart, check out, and it comes back. Uh, in virtual plant, our users, our customers, or biologists, they may have a gene list, a list of genes that they like, it's a pathway, it's something that's regulated by your favorite thing. Uh, they have data, they have microarray data or other kinds of metabolomic data. So the difference between us and, and the e-commerce sites is in addition to browsing and querying our database, you can actually upload your own data. We, like, uh, we think we were the first people to have a gene cart. And the gene cart is important because you have these lists of genes, um, you store them in your cart and you can then iteratively analyze and refine your queries. So you could store your genes in your cart and you check out either reports or analysis and visualization tools, including gene networks. You get the results back. It's gonna give you a new hypothesis. You refine your analysis and go again. So this iterative cycle of uh, 
analysis, refinement, hypothesis generation, new data is uh, a highlight of systems biology. So uh, the virtual plant uh, homepage it has basically your list of genes that you love. Uh, it, it's a lightweight data browser. It's got the data that everybody kind of likes, like the NASP database and believes in. And then it's got a bunch of tools that you could select. So for example, you can analyze your gene list by go term overrepresentation using the biomaps function. Mm, you can analyze and compare your gene lists using a function called SunGear. It's basically like a Venn diagram on speed uh, because you have, you, you're not limited to three, uh, comparing three things. And what it does is you load up your gene lists, those are the vertices, and then it compares those gene lists. Uh, so for example, here are the genes that are only responsive to carbon, and here are the genes that are only responsive to nitrogen, and here are the ones that are shared by both. And the size of the vessel is proportional to the number of genes. It's also linked to a function here that tells you, gives you the z-score for the overrepresentation of terms in that vessel. And we use the z-score because it's an interactive and rapid thing, but anything over a z-score of nine would survive a more rigorous statistical test, like um, gene networks, uh, hubbiness tables, and supernode analysis. So if you have, you could view your genes not just as lists or biomaps functions, but as supernodes of functions like we see in this <coughs> network that um, carbohydrate metabolism and uh, lipid metabolism are both uh, regulated in this network. So again, we have virtual plant Arabidopsis. We've, re we've developed virtual plant rice, and we've recently uh, uh, developed virtual plant maize. Virtual plant Arabidopsis, they all have the functions of Biomap, SunGear, GeneSect. Um, a lot of the network functions are Arabidopsis, um, specific, are enhanced by Arabidopsis data, because for the gene networks, in the crop species, for example, you're mostly limited to correlation networks. There is some other data for rice, but not so much for maize. So we think that uh, because these are interoperate, you can actually use the Arabidopsis network knowledge to inform studies in maize. And so I think that our current work is on translating network knowledge from Arabidopsis to crop species for reasons that uh, we think that the Arabidopsis network knowledge can help us interrogate gene functions in crops, even especially in annotation. So when we had a set of nitrogen-regulated genes in maize, and it resulted in a correlation network of 5,000 genes, uh, half of which were not annotated. When we interrogated that data in the context of nitrogen-regulated genes in Arabidopsis, we came up with a much smaller set of genes in the hundreds and some of our favorite uh, hubs were conserved between Arabidopsis and maize, some of which we had already validated in Arabidopsis. So that was kind of a surprise that across those phylogenetic distances we could come up with that knowledge. So these examples have given you examples of where we cr big data uh, used to generate networks derives hypotheses the, uh, that are validated that uncover new biology. Um, I'm not sure if I have five minutes, I can do it. So in five minutes, I wanna tell you about my really cool project that's my non-Arabidopsis life that's done in collaboration with uh, myself, the Botanical Garden, the American Museum in Cold Spring Harbor. And the concept is this. Um, there's a lot of traits that have evolved in nature. And now that we could sequence any genome we want, A, what genomes will you sequence? And B, can you use those sequences to identify the genes underlying the traits that have evolved? That's the big picture. I'm into big pictures, if you hadn't noticed. Um, so this is a fantastic collaborative project because everybody brings to it a different expertise. But uh, one of the main drivers of the project was Ernest Lee, who's now here at UC, uh, in Davis. I'm not sure he's not at UC Davis, somewhere. He's in LA, which is close to here. I flew the air from LA this morning. It's a hop, skip, and a jump. So what Ernie did was uh, he developed, so 
we said, okay, so originally we are going to focus on a bunch of plants that we liked, but Ernie developed this pipeline that enabled him to download uh, data from NCBI for all fully, all sequenced genomes. They don't have to be fully sequenced. Uh, a lot, um, do gene clustering to identify genes in a family, align them, make gene family trees, identify orthologs using an automated program I'm not going to tell you about, and then it's called ortholog ID, and then for each species to make a concatenated matrix of all the genes from that species that have orthologs in the other species. And then you make a total evidence tree, so this is the, a, a phylogenetic tree based on all available gene sequences for that species. The important part of this pipeline is here in red. Rather than just constructing a tree to understand how the species are related, we want to point to a node that separates two branches, for example, let's say monocots versus dicots, and we could identify the genes that support the divergence of these two clades. Uh, that's called positive branch support. The idea would be if I took a gene out that provides positive branch support, the support for that node would weaken or collapse. That's what positive branch support is. So we take all the genes that provide positive branch support, and now we look for overrepresented GO terms to tell us the biological processes that have diverged between these two uh, groups. And then we actually, I'll show you, we've developed a way for people to do this uh, interactively. So here's the result with big plant. Uh, it has 150 taxa, 121 genera. At the time, there were thir five fully sequenced genomes. There are now 31 fully sequenced genomes. And uh, that was back in 11. And 145 taxa that had at least 2,000 unigenes. That was the criteria. So this turns out to be the only matrix, the only uh, database that can house uh, partially sequenced genomes and interrogate them in a phylogenetic context. So iPlant is interested in incorporating this into their homology browser function and we're working with them. You can't see it up here, but what this bar, these bars here, is represent the number of genes from that species that contribute to this tree. So there's a lot of missing data, especially in the gymnosperms, and we're working to correct that. And then the red balls just mean if there's a red ball, there's greater than 95% bootstrap support. So it's a, it's a good tree. It follows all the rules. The, there's no surprises in the relationship of these plants. What we do want to do is point to the nodes that separate the clades and say, what are the genes that underlie the branches, for example, branching of, let's say, the monocots from the dicots? So in one example, you can see that there are three nodes that have overrepresented GO terms in the rosids and asterids for genes involved in oxygen and radical detoxification. And we know that we eat these plants because they're rich in antioxidants. So this gene-centric approach has come up with a biological function, which is a trait that has evolved in these plants. Another example is in the chorophyllids that are drought tolerant, and it turns out they're drought tolerant because they make these sulfur compounds, and in fact, sulfur compound metabolic processes are overrepresented at this node. So those are kind of like biological validation for the approach. An unexpected discovery was that at the split of the monocots and the dicots, genes involved in RNAi metabolism provided positive branch support for this split. And it turns out, for example, in RDR6, a mutation in one of those residues that provides positive branch support from the split has no, that mutation has no effect in Arabidopsis, but it has a severe effect in rice, signifying that that residue is different in its function between those two. Um, and finally, just to say that tar Tamara has, um, there's a lot of information in this tree that we would like people to browse and interrogate. Those were only a few examples. So Tara uh, created what we call Philo Browse, and uh, you could browse this tree. You can select for a Go term that's overrepresented in the tree, and Philo Browse will show you the path and the species in uh, that that term is overrepresented. 
Um, and this is a little movie that kind of goes all around. Uh, you can uh, hover on a node in the network and it'll tell you the overrepresented Go terms. You can hover twice. You could collapse a node, expand a node, and you could also browse by selecting a Go term and it'll show you the uh, nodes at which that Go term is significant. So um, uh, this uh, new feature called Philo Browser is available on our website. And I think in my summary thing abstract, I gave the website, so I hope you'll visit it. And thank you, I think I took more than the five minutes. My guns are loaded. <laughs> On the state space modeling, did they use something that had biologically motivated functional forms for the functions, or was it something like this slide? What functions do you mean? Well, the things, that, the, the things you were trying to estimate. The F function? Yeah. So the F function is based on, uh, basically, it's a, like a linear regression model of the expression of the transcription factors up to 10 at time t that would then explain the value of a target gene at time t plus 1. The thing I can't explain to you is what the function is that takes the raw data and converts it into this uh, um, noise-free version. Mm, not, I can't explain that one. But I think that's why it worked on transcription, transcriptome data is really noisy. And it's also surprising it would work because basically, okay, here's the other reason that that little function does, is because it's not like the RNA from the transcription factor is doing the work, it's the protein, right? So that little function there somehow um, gives you some kind of fudge factor in between RNA and protein to explain your result. That's Gloria's understanding, kind of. So I had a question. It, it, it does, uh, does the model of the, the network make some prediction for nitrogen use efficiency? What, what would make an efficient system versus a non-efficient system? Well, so I guess, for example, in the, maybe the best example I could give. So the two, two examples. If uh, plants assimilate nitrogen into glutamine when nitrogen's available and repress it in response, I have enough, stop, right? If you disabled the stop function, maybe you could get more into the seed. And in fact, when we overexpressed, for example, in the old molecular genetic days, we just turned up the gain on the gene for asparagine synthetase, which is normally only on sometimes when organic nitrogen is high, we actually got more nitrogen into seeds in Arabidopsis. So tweaking uh, a repressor is one way possibly. And then in the root foraging, um, if you could get plants to forage for more nitrogen in the soil, um, that should do it. And so I, my Montpellier project was to do that split root across the ecotypes which actually vary a lot in their foraging ability, surprisingly. So visually, I could see it. I didn't even have, I mean, I quantified it, but I didn't have to. So if we could identify the genes that enable one guy to really forage, that would be another way. And if you do a combination of, and I guess the other thing about this approach is rather than tweaking the downstream target genes, we want to tweak the regulatory genes that coordinate nitrogen assimilation with photosynthesis. You don't want to do one without the other, and I think that's the big advantage of the systems approach. Yeah? So um, I, I like the correlation between the circadian rhythm and nitrogen assimilation, but do you think that it's biologically relevant to push <laughs> back in the other direction? Does the whole circadian set shift or is it just something relevant to nitrogen? Um, so, so the experiment is that, you, so the way the circadian clock it can be reset is if something is a signal, it will, a, as a pulse, it will reset the clock. Mm 
And so using CCA1, really just that CCA1 luciferase gene is a reporter for circadian regulation, right? It itself is a reporter. And so its expression is circadian. And so when you do these pulses, uh, and then you compare the circadian regulation of the CCA1 luciferase reporter in the treated plants compared to the non-treated plants, if there was no change in the, in the wave, then it has no effect. But in the case of nitrate, it phase advanced, and in the case of glutamate, it phase delayed by two hours. It's not a huge uh, shift, but for other metabolites in other systems, there is metabolic regulation of the clock in other systems, and I can't remember whether it's cyanobacteria. I can't remember right now which other system it is. So, it's, so there is precedence for nutrient control of the clock. Why plants do it? That's a question. Um, I think it's possibly a way to coordinate their metabolism with uh, when nitrogen's around, let's do all this other stuff that we need to do during the day, and we do other stuff at night, right? So, but you also wonder how much, knowing as we do now that everything is connected, that it's just an unfortunate consequence of having everything. Well, connected. you know, um, I don't think it's an unfortunate consequence because people who work on the clock, and I'm really on thin ground here in front <laughs> of my former student Joanna Chu, who's the expert. Um, a lot of um, you could say phase delaying the clock is easy. You do something bad to it, give it a chemical or you know, phase delays, but phase advances are rare, and it's, you know, so that I think it's a real effect on the clock, and I think it's a real way for the clock to coordinate activities in metabolism with development and with carbon and photosynthesis. I don't think it's an accident. I think it's a design. Whose design, right? <laughs> well, let's yeah. <coughs> you said of your talk, you mentioned about extrapolating networks and hops to hop species, and uh, it, it obviously makes intuitive sense. But I was wondering how much of it could be um, useful given that crops are not necessarily grown under controlled conditions. So how many of these networks or hops do you think would be stable, or do you need a different approach? Yeah. So I I should I I guess I mentioned it in passing. Uh, we took our uh, nitrogen-regulated genes from Arabidopsis grown in our lab in some artificial plant cons or however we did it, tissue culture plates. And then there was a published data set on nitrogen-regulated genes uh, as using biomarkers in maize done in the field under different conditions, day, length, blah, blah, blah. And we actually performed an analysis and an intersect of those data sets in a network context and were astounded <laughs> that we found a core regulatory network conserved between the two, including a number of hubs that we had actually validated to be involved in Arabidopsis. So I think the translational aspect would be to find these core conserved things between Arabidopsis and, and crop plants and, and to use them to say, okay, these are the components I can tweak in Arabidopsis that may have a relevance to the field, but then there's going to be others in these crop plants that are specific to the crop plants. So I think that the advantage of the network uh, comparison to Arabidopsis is there's a lot of network knowledge that is available only in Arabidopsis so far, and until that data is available for crop plants, I think it's uh, a huge a huge benefit to interrogate crop data in the context of the Arabidopsis network. Okay, so I'll wrap up. So I'll thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh la la, thank you. That was cool.